And it's the first one for 2022. Great to have you join us on uh, Business Morning. I'm Ladi Williams. First off, let's uh, take a look at uh, what's in the news. See, uh, all prices rose today as the market kicked off 2022 on a positive note, although concerns over demand waning due to rapidly spreading COVID-19 pandemic limited gains. Uh, Brent crude added 67 cents to $78.45 a barrel. And U.S. West Texas intermediate crude futures uh, gained about 77 cents to $75.98 a barrel. Last year, oil prices rose around 50%, spurred by the global economic recovery from COVID-19 pandemic slump and uh, producer restraint, even as infections reached record highs worldwide. Oil analysts have lowered their price forecast for uh, 2022 as the Omicron coronavirus variant poses headwinds to recovering fuel demand and risk of supply glut as producers pump more oil, as uh, shown by Reuters' uh, poll. And a recent report from the World Bank shows Nigeria may have one of the highest inflation rates globally in 2022, with increasing prices diminishing uh, the welfare of Nigerian households. According to the World Bank, it is uh, November edition of the Nigeria Development Update, Nigeria is projected to have one of the highest inflation rates globally and the seventh highest among uh, sub-Saharan African countries in 2022. Bank further highlighted the adverse effects of inflation on Nigeria, which include pushing 8 million Nigerians into poverty and a possible disruption of consumption, investment and saving decisions, among other consequences. And after the break, as we say goodbye to 2021, we take stock of uh, what's happened in the economy and uh, the outlook for 2022. That's our first conversation in a moment. Do stay with us. Welcome back. Well, as we say goodbye to 2021, quite an interesting year that shook major economies of the world, from health and, uh, to economic risk. Uh, now we take a look at uh, prospects for 2022 uh, with Mr. Bismarck Rwani, CEO, financial derivatives company. Great to have you on the program. On the first day, 2022. Yeah, happy new year. <laughs> happy new year. Sir. To all the viewers out there. Too. Yeah. So, you know, 2021 is over. And yeah. you described it as the year full of ups, downs, downs uh, bumps along the road. Yeah. How bumpy was it? It was a tough year. <laughs> uh, we started the year with hope that this would be the end of the, uh, what do you call it, the COVID-19 pandemic. We thought by this time of the year, by this time next year, we will be honky donkey. But no, what happened was that there were some good things that happened, and uh, in all, there are about 16 good things, and I, I, I just rolled them out. The GDP per capita grew by 4% in the third quarter. Base effects, it wasn't that the economy did great. Uh, total factor productivity, which is an important variable, for the first time in many years, was positive. Inflation, official inflation, was down from 18.7 to 15.4. Budget expenditure was up by 20%. Um, we are set to commission the largest fertilizer plant in Africa. Uh, we also saw corporate profits up by over 30%. And stock market capitalization was up by about 3.61%. Nigeria raised about $547 million from the 5G auction alone and raised $4 billion from the Eurobond market, got $3.35 billion from the special drawing rights like every other country, and also enjoyed some palliatives from the IMF. Airline passengers were up by about 17% based on the previous year, which was a low year. But the thing is that there was strong data and perplexed people. Perplexed, perplexed means baffled, totally puzzled. Why is this happening? Why am I reading or hearing of all these things where I don't feel it? Now, so one, income per capita declined. Two, the Naira lost about 55% of its value in the, over the last three years. There were two recessions in the last five years. Life expectancy in Nigeria was is 55 years, the fourth lowest in the world. Unemployment rate at 33%, and 93 million people in poverty. Road accidents up by 4.57% to 5,110, and diaspora remittances dropped. That was the key thing. Now, the major issue facing most Nigerians are, why are you saying that inflation, official inflation is declining? 15.4% actually set to go down to about 
directionally we call it right, but in nominal terms, no. But when we carried out our own synthetic basket analysis, we saw those prices actually increased by 88% between last year and year. And you take, take a look at all of it. So take, for example, cooking gas, 3,600 last December. This December, it's up to 8,200, even it had got to 10,500. Take a flight ticket from Lagos to Abuja. It used to be 36,000 round. Now it's 73,000. Uh, diesel was 195 last year. Now it's 350. Flour was 13,500. So you go on and on, all the way to table water. So you got 88%. So the problem is that what does the official data say? And does it reflect the reality, how you feel it in the market? Right. That's a big problem. Mm -hmm. Because we see that uh, there seems to be some, you know, disparity when you look at the, the synthetic basket. You know, basket and, you know, the national, uh, basket. national basket, there's uh, some kind of uh, a disparity there. What do you think? Uh, causes no, the point is that we, we, we last reconstituted our basket in Nigeria about 2009. It's due for another review, right? So um, that's work in progress, right? And NBS is working on that. But as long as that is good, but also, Data integrity has become an issue in Nigeria. Do you believe what you hear or do you believe what you see and how you don't feel it? So there must be empirical evidence and an anecdotal evidence, which is when you go to the supermarket, are you paying more? Your salary is stretching you. You used to finish it maybe on the 30th. Now, by the 20th, you're already looking and scrambling around. So those are the key issues. And with wages remaining you know, Stagnant. constant. As a matter of fact, so that becomes a problem as you go into this whole subsidy removal debate, whilst it is good, the people are saying, look, we are stretched, and therefore the environment becomes very difficult, but you gotta do what you have to do, irrespective of the political environment. And we see the government is, you know, they've talked about uh, 5,000 naira stipend for, you know, the vulnerable <laughs> yeah. in society. How, how's that gonna help? Well, it's, it's a difficult situation. The point is that if you, when the price of oil increases, there will be some inflationary impacts one way or the other. By the time you put money in the pockets of people without productivity gains, it will, you know, it will only make it worse. So it's something that I think the policymakers are debating on how best, one, to achieve price deregulation in petroleum and also achieve growth without encouraging smuggling and uh, all the uh, adverse effects of a distorted price level in right. petroleum. And, and you know, looking at you know putting monies in the in the pocket in people's pockets, you know, there's another issue of uh, rising uh, money in circulation. Yes. You know, that's another problem. You know, that yeah, also. No. You know, the truth is that the good news about that is that money supply is about 42 trillion naira, while cash in circulation is three trillion naira. So. Over the years, over the last 10, 20, 30 years, we've seen cash transactions drop, POS, not POS, uh, electronic transfers, and all that, internet banking has increased. So the cashless policy, aside from anything else, has become an imperative, not only in Nigeria, but across Sub-Saharan Africa. To that extent, you are, now, you are now seeing that the fact that liquidity does not mean income, the fact that liquidity, there is an increase in liquidity, does not necessarily mean that people have income to spend. You can borrow liquidity, but income you have to earn. And so a lot of policymakers are confused. Oh yes, there's excess liquidity, let's, let's get CRR, let's do this and all that. But that, what is important that income, consumption is a major driver of growth. And when incomes are squeezed and people can have no money to spend, then there will be less demand for goods and it will affect the corporate Entities. Right, and you know, policymakers do have a decision to make here because uh, most uh, other economies are, are looking at hikes, yeah. you know, rate hikes. But uh, coming to Nigeria here, what, what do you see happening? Because there's also well, talk about a possibility. The reality is that the, we've got to the limits of monetary policy. So that's why we're going into an orthodox monetary policy. The reality is that you cannot have interest rates at four, five percent, and inflation rate at 15 percent, and expect national savings and investment to grow. There's a contradiction in there. So, uh, and you can't hold one down and then allow the other one to grow. So that's, 
But for the man on the street, the reality is that how, how is my well-being? Am I better off today than I was a year ago or than I was five years ago? And the question comes up, yes, the people are actually struggling, right? But, you know, As one of your slides, I saw <laughs> a fat man yes. uh, that you know, and became a slim leaner. Man. Yeah. <laughs> the, the reality is that before COVID, that's a big man out there. And then post-COVID, he, he lost weight for COVID reasons, but he also lost weight for economic reasons. So it's a combination of health and economic crisis. That's why the man has been forced to slim down. Has lost a lot of weight. Yes. Well, good for his health, but uh, <laughs> well, your report it says uh, you know while the people are struggling, yes, you know we've seen companies actually doing well. Yeah, what's responsible for that? Well, the reality is that the top five companies alone made seven hundred eighty-eight billion naira profit after tax last year, but they paid three hundred eighty-six billion naira as tax. It's interesting that that happened. And they employed more than 250,000 people. The, the definition of profit is reward for risk taken. So those who took the risks, and we, we, we looked at five companies here. We looked at uh, Dangote, MTN, Airtel, Boa, and Nestle. And let's see what they did. They took the risks. And we are talking about Dangote cement alone, not of the entire group, right? They grew, their revenues grew by 34%, and their profits grew by 33%. So if you take inflation of 15 and an exchange rate depreciation on the all put together, you'll find that the Dangote Cement Company has actually outperformed the two put together. You take MTN, MTN actually had 52% growth in profit compared to inflation of 15, sector growth of about 7%, and paid taxes of over 101 billion naira. Dangote Group Cement alone paid 127 billion naira of taxes. Boa paid taxes of 8 billion. Its profits grew. Its revenue grew by 19% and its profits grew by over 23%. Nestle, and then you take Zenit Bank. So when you look at those companies, you'll find that they've, they've done extremely well, but for risk taken. And it's not a zero-sum game. It's not because the big companies are doing well. The small companies are struggling. The policies uh, tend to reward the bigger companies because they have incentives and economies of scale. But the, the big companies also use the services of small companies to buy raw materials, buy machinery and all of that. So fertilizers are used for the Angkor Boros program, the petrochemicals. So a lot of these things are happening. There's, uh, you, you want us to look at it in the context of what is going to happen. For example, if you take when the Dangote refinery is commissioned at the end of this year or early next year, okay. then will it solve all our problems? No. But it will go a long way because it's going to be exporting refined products across Central and West Africa. It's going to be exporting petrochemical. Know, fertilizers already. Fertilizers are already in the market. And the price of fertilizer have gone, have gone up by almost two to three hundred percent this year because of supply chain disruptions. How would that, what impact would that have on agricultural productivity? Because in spite of all the things we've done in agriculture, agriculture is still growing at less than two percent. Right. So I, I think the emphasis here is that the corporates have to be incentivized, especially those that are well diverse you know, diversified products, right? For example, take MTN. They paid $275 million for the uh, bid for the 5G. Then they're going to invest about over almost a billion or $2 billion, right, to roll out this. And it gives you a head start. In fact, the United States companies are begging to be allowed to use 5G. Well, in fact, here we, we are rolling out. Rolling out, yes. yeah. We'll talk about Nestle. Nestle is also, you know, working. They have their, their plants, their cocoa, their Maggi Cube, and all of that. Now, because of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, we need to encourage these corporates to manufacture here and ship across Africa rather than, you know, importing. So the, if you want to have an investment-led strategy as according to the development plan of Nigeria over the next five years, 
you need to encourage these big investors to do that, not at the expense of the small man, right? Because the small man is struggling, but the employment and jobs are only going to be created when the investors, both small, medium, and large investors begin to invest in our economy. Now we can see smaller companies actually yeah. are paying huge uh, chunks of tax. At oh, point. yes. Um, but we've also, they've had tax credits, you know, for these, you know, big companies. How, yes. how did that impact? Well, it's, let me put it this way. Some of those companies are now swapping their tax for construction. In other words, you have MTN building a road from Onisha to Enugu. Um, Dangote Group building all of these roads. One, it helps them because they can sell cement. It helps them provide. But it, the thing is, is that before they would have paid this tax as cash, then they can go to the ministry before they are oh, what a contract. Before you find, now you are seeing the direct impact. Is it the best way to go? No, it's not the most efficient way to go. But it, you can feel it and you can see it. And the people can feel the impact. The productivity gains when the roads have been built, concrete, you know, affordable housing, and all of these things, that helps you to actually see the impact of these corporate bodies on Nigeria. And uh, going into 2022, do you see us having, you know, more of this, like when it comes to, you know, tax credit? Yeah, 2022 is a year of politics, two halves. The first half is, you know, the next three months would just be about putting the policy framework and then kick-starting, but from February, March, once you have the conventions and primaries, nobody's going to be talking about this anymore. People are going to be talking about how are you going to run down the clock, because this is the twilight, twilight days of this administration, and therefore, people are looking forward to what's going to happen next, right. well, and well, whether there'll be consistency. Next. Yeah, I, I think that's important to, to, to bear in mind, but certain things that you must bear in mind, for example, we talk about the traffic congestion in as a productivity inhibitor. Traffic congestion, in, if you lived in Lagos, or you live in Lagos, you, are, you spend about 1,080 hours a year in, in traffic, traffic, compared to 148 in the city of London, which is the worst among the advanced economies. With an average lifespan of 55 years, it means you spend six or seven years of your life in traffic. That is alarming. That's, so whilst Lagos, is responsible for 20% of the GDP of Nigeria. While Lagos has all of these facilities, it's also a drain on the lives of people. Exactly. So I, I think that's a major issue to okay. look at. All right, Mr. Rand, we'll, we'll continue this conversation after the break. There's still more <laughs> oh, yes. we have to you know, dive into. Anyway, uh, you're still watching our business this morning. After the break, we'll continue the conversation with uh, Mr. Rwani. Do stay with us. Welcome back. Uh, we're still talking uh, the economy of 2021 and expectations for uh, 2021. Well, I still have uh, Mr. Bismarck Rwani, CEO of Financial Derivatives Company. Thank you for staying on uh, the program with us, sir. So uh, in your table of sub-Saharan African currencies, the Naira depreciated the most, and uh, yet it has the highest export uh, earnings. Yes. What's responsible for that? That's a big problem. You see, there's structure, there's policy, and there's market efficiency. I think that, yes, we were told that because of COVID, price of oil dropped, therefore the Naira weakened. Now, the price of oil is 88% above what it was a year ago, right? And it's about almost 49% above the budget benchmark. The reserves are up to about over $40 billion. The gross external reserves are up $40 billion. Then why is the currency struggling? The currency is struggling because of you know this, what you call this uh, multiple exchange rates and a policy that needs that needs refining, which um, the Central Bank of Nigeria is working on, right? But our projections are that based on some scenarios, you are going to have the naira appreciate if certain things are done. One, increase the supply into the market, and two, change the structure of the market to make sure that investment flows are as important as production. You see, we concentrate on the current account balance, that is what we export and what we import. But if you don't create a policy where investors will have confidence to bring money in, the investment flows are what make up for the difference between your, 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 your invisibles. And that's very important to understand that. Uh, but 
again, it wasn't just Nigeria. All the, currency, all the countries suffered from a currency depreciation. But what is interesting is that Nigeria and Angola are oil producers. In the last 12 months, the Angolan currency is the only one that has appreciated amongst most of the African currencies. Quite interesting because yes. they had a lot of you know, controversy. Absolutely. Yeah. But you see, they are beginning to adopt market-driven policies, right? Just like Egypt. And so you see these things happening. And you, Nigeria will have no choice in the next, in the coming months and more, coming years, but to adopt a much more flexible and market-driven currency management strategy. Okay. It's very, very important. Okay. Yes. Now, uh, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, another thing, you know, looking at, you know, your report, it says uh, 2022 will be a year of two themes. Yes. You know, at the second half of the year, we dominated by politics. Yes. How does, you know, election affect, you know, economic activities? Well, normally, normally, when there are elections, investors get weary, markets get, right? But what we've seen is that in 2015, in spite of the fact that there were elections coming, the, pos the factors were positive. In 2019, the economy did not suffer that much during that re-election. So we do not expect that the political activities will negatively impact economic outcomes this time. However, if there's, why do we say that? We say that because technology is now beginning to make it almost very difficult for you to rig elections. Very, very difficult because of biometric facial recognition. Well, we've seen what happened in Edo State, very clear, right? No matter, you, Whatever, whatever you did, the people spoke. And we had no choice but to allow the true result reflect. Anambra State was another example. So if that is anything to go by, politicians are having sleepless nights because they need to now deliver. So do you want a, do you want a safe pair of hands that can take this economy? Or do you want just same old, same old? So it's a question of, are we just going to do the business is the same way? No, I do not think so. I think 2023 will be a year in which the people will determine exactly what they want because the people get the governments or the leadership they deserve. It is not the leadership that determines. It is the people that determine because they are the owners. Right. They are the landlords. Right. The leaders in office are only tenants. They come four years and they go. Four years passes very quickly. Okay. That's what it is. Okay. All right, Mr. Ron. Well, it's uh, early days. Yes. <laughs> we'll but see how the... <laughs> in, in summary, the outlook for 2022 yes. is that we believe that by this time, we have only about 370 days more for the election and about 500 days for handover. Uh, it's going to be a very interesting first quarter. You're going to see two MPC meetings in the first quarter. You are going to see GDP growth numbers come out. You are going to see inflation come out. Inflation will increase before declining. The currency will wobble before stabilizing. People are going to be better off next year because what happens, there's nothing that, nothing that is more permanent than change itself. Change itself. Change itself. Thank All right, Mr. Rwani, thank you so much uh, for coming on the program. Our first uh, episode in 2022. Happy New Year to <laughs> Happy everybody. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Uh, Mr. Bismarck Rwani, CEO of Financial uh, Derivatives uh, Company. Well, uh, now to our next uh, conversation. Well, political economists have the view that economic development does not happen uh, by accident in any country. Rather, it's a result of careful planning and efficient allocation of resources under a leadership that is committed to achieving that task. Well. Nigeria has enjoyed over five decades of political freedom, but how has this impacted development? Well, to weigh on this matter, we have Mr. Soji Apampa, our co-founder, CEO of the Integrity Organization uh, Limited. Happy New Year, sir, and great to have you on the program. And the same to you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. So, you know, 2021 was a challenging year for global economies, COVID-19, inflation, and other uh, headwinds. How would you describe performance of uh, leadership in the past year as regards economic performance? Well, I think the only way to look at um, economic performance is looking at the impact on the ordinary person. I think the prices of most things have gone up 
um, what used to cost 30 naira before is now costing up to uh, 67, 70 percent more than that. So in terms of how people feel, I think people feel worse off. Um, it, it, and that is the economic climate that we're in at the moment. Uh, Chinua Achebe, in one of his books, said the trouble with Nigeria is simply and squarely a failure of uh, leadership. Do, do you agree? I totally agree. Um, I, I think Chinua Achebe, in his usual form, is spot on. Um, and the reason for this is that the direction in which the whole country is going is charted by leadership. The policies that are adopted are proposed by leadership. The, the implementation or the failure to implement those policies effectively is done and supervised by leadership. So if you continue to feel adverse effects of the, in the political arena or economic or social, in whatever arena it is, then it flows back to the leadership. However, we shouldn't keep thinking of leadership only in terms of people who are elected to office. After all, we, we, we are all leaders uh, where we are, whether we're in, in the private sector or public sector, we're all leaders. So we should think of Chinua Achebe's statement much broader than just uh, political leadership. Because if you look at the behavior of people on the roads, um, the refusal to, to, to queue up and so on, that is also a leadership choice at that material time. So um, I think the failure of leadership is what is showing through all strata of life in Nigeria at the moment. Right, but, but, but surely we, we can't, you know, all be leaders, you know, uh, talking about, you know, public office. So what can we do to address, you know, this uh, trouble with, uh, with Nigeria? It's true we can't all be leaders, uh, but th there is the saying, the simple definition of leadership is example. Example is leadership. So once you choose to behave a certain way and others follow you, you are a leader. So um, I think private citizens, um, uh, private companies, other than uh, those who are elected into office, also have a role in leadership. Take, for example, you, you, somebody pulls out of an orderly queue and beats the traffic light. You will find many other people who will follow. That is example and it's more powerful, it's a very powerful form of leadership. So what we can do is to choose the, the behaviors that build integrity. For example, we, we need to say when things are not working. Even just simply speaking up that something isn't working and needs to be fixed. If enough of us speak up about it, that is a different form of leadership, but it's the kind of leadership that shows a demand for a policy or a change in policy that the policymakers will find very difficult to ignore. So we also, um, the lead in quotes, need to be able to demonstrate a level of leadership in order to deal with the trouble with Nigeria. All right, talking about, you know, private citizens and, you know, the private sector, you know, demonstrating leadership. But are we relying on just the few at the helm of affairs, you know, the public sector to actually change the narrative in Nigeria? Okay, uh, let me give you an example where, where this has actually worked. Um, in 2011, um, the UK Bribery Act was put into place. And the year after, uh, in 2012, after it came into force, the, in the maritime sector, most of the CEOs there came together and formed what is called the Maritime Anti-Corruption Network. And the first thing they did was to approach the government of Nigeria because that UK Bribery Act says failure to prevent bribery is an offense. 
So for the first time, it became an offense um, if you failed to prevent bribery. So they were afraid of what will happen if their vessels and their shipmasters came to Nigeria and bribed a public official in Nigeria, they will be liable back home. So they wrote to the presidency and asked the presidency to join with them to do something about the levels of corruption. To cut a long story short, the presidency at the time agreed and they have been working together with the private sector leading uh, the, the, the charge uh, and improving the environment for um, vessel clearance in Nigeria uh, to the extent that Nigeria is seen somewhat as an example. And remember I said example is leadership. Um, so Nigeria is now beginning to show some leadership because of the collective action between the private sector and the public sector. So yes, the public sector is still responsible for implementing some of these things, but the imagination, the vision of what is possible, and, and the, the, the paths and the options that could be taken, sometimes you need the private sector and private citizens to actually show that example and show what could be uh, before you can get the public sector. So it's not the public sector alone, it's everyone together that are working collectively in order to make this work. All right, and you know, leadership shown by affected groups on key public service issues, you know, and addressed by dedicated public servants is, is quite admirable, but uh, how much impact can this achieve? Well, uh, if you permit me to just stay on the example of the maritime sector that I mentioned, um, in terms of achievement, what the ship masters did in 2019 was to complain about the demands for large cash payments from public officials. There were 266 uh, de such demands that were reported. But by 2020, and with the actions that the government took in partnership with the private sector, this fell to 128 complaints and by this, uh, and by 2021, there were only 51 uh, or so such reports. So you can see that year on year, the levels of, of demands for such large cash payments reduced drastically simply because the private sector took a level of leadership and the public sector itself responded with the kind of leadership that was required to keep these things under control. So there is a great impact that could come out of either private citizens with one voice or the private sector with one voice speaking about an issue. So those who are beneficiaries of services from government or, or, or um, anything provided by government should understand that it is their leadership responsibility to give feedback and to stay with it and to follow through until those things are, are repaired. So uh, at least this is the kind of impact that we have seen occur over the years in the maritime sector. Quite interesting, uh, you know, what's happening in that sector. But do you envisage a situation in which, you know, Nigeria as a nation might begin to show leadership to, to the rest of the world, or is this too much of a stretch of, of the concept? Well, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to report that in this sequence of things that I've been uh, talking about, for example, in the maritime sector since 2012, um, it has gotten to a stage now that other countries have noticed. Ghana noticed, and they got in touch with Nigeria Shippers Council, and they made a visit to Nigeria to look at some of the things going on here. I'm also happy to note that Ukraine is understudying what Nigeria is doing, and they're also now trying to improve their maritime sector based on what Nigeria is doing. Egypt also started about mid-year last year, and India is starting this January. So if we stay with the idea that I, example is leadership, Nigeria is beginning to show a different kind of example than the one it was known for. 
And it's also good to note that these are the sorts of business people who get surveyed by Transparency International annually to feel their pulse on the ease of doing business and what it means, what, what levels of corruption um, there is in doing business with Nigerian officials and so on. So it wouldn't be surprising if in a couple of years we start to see improved figures coming from this if Nigeria keeps this sort of uh, responsiveness, if it keeps it up and keeps it going. So um, I, I think that Nigeria is an example here. Also in the entertainment industry, we know that Nigeria is the example. You go to Terminal 5 in the UK, it's Nigerian music being played. If it's Nollywood, you know Nigeria is also setting the pace and making an example in sports as well. If even in football, the, the sort of um, footballers that we're exporting. So in many ways, Nigeria is actually showing leadership. We just need to change the narrative. We need to speak about these things that we're doing and get people to do more of it so that Nigerians choose the path of integrity over the path of corruption. And right. that will help us um, take our pride of place um, amongst the Committee of Nations. Right. I guess uh, we all have a, a role to play in, in all of this. All right, uh, Mr. Papa, I'm gonna, I want to thank you so much for uh, coming on the program. Mr. Shoji Papa is a co-founder and CEO of the Integrity Organization Limited. And uh, Happy New Year. Thank you. Happy New Year to you. All right, now, after the break, uh, we head on uh, to the markets. Uh, that's in a moment. Do stay with us. This is Business Morning. Welcome back. Now to an opening, uh, for an opening call to the market, we have uh, Aniete Edet. Well, Aniete, it's a new year. How's it looking? Yeah, Ladi, like you rightly said, it's a new year. I, I, I missed the party. I missed uh, what uh, you people gathering all the, the business uh, <laughs> desk. Uh, well, I was just caught in traffic. Right. But right. Uh, I still wish you a happy new year. Yeah, happy new year. Yeah. So now let's give you a run through into the market, how it closed the last trading day of 2021. And of course, a year-to-day performance of uh, some of the markets. But first, we start with the FX market. It was mostly negative there. The only positive that we had was on the futures uh, part of the FX market, trading at the FMDQ. It was up by 52.55%, but all the rest were down by more than 50, uh, 57%. That's for the FX spot and the force market. The FX derivatives was down by 21.50%. Total... 49, nearly 50, 49.86% down. That's for the total transactions there. Then at the investors and exporters window, it's still a negative uh, performance there, 57.72% at $419.01 million traded for the uh, Forex market uh, transactions at the investors and exporters window. Of course, at the uh, Nigeria Autonomous um, Exchange uh, window, it was down by 0.181%. Not much of activity there. And of course, a very lackluster performance for the market. Flipping over to the fixed income market, the fixed income market, not much of activity there. It was mixed sentiment all through for the bonds market. Um, the the average, average, uh, average yield there was at 11.6%. Um, uh, 11, 11 then the total number of deals there was Thirteen value was 29.83%. Over to the Treasury bills market, also no much of activity there. Of course, we had just three trading sessions last week, and of course, we had a primary market uh, auction um, at um, at the Treasury bills market there, uh, where the, the, the central bank offered 52.31 billion naira worth of instruments. And then, of course, the demand was there was very very strong. 82.52. Uh, 82.25 billion naira worth of uh, demand there, but that eventually the central bank allotted 52.76 billion naira worth of treasury bills instruments there. Now, for the expectations, we're expecting that uh, investors will sustain buying activities at the treasury bills market. Uh, of course, we're also expecting that uh, inflows from 50 billion naira uh, OMO maturities will hit the market this week. And of course, traders are expecting that debits from cash reserve uh, ratio 
and um, central banks' weekly auctions inflows are expected to outweigh this maturities at the Treasury bills market. Then for the fixed income market, we're expecting that um, the yields will oscillate around the current levels and then activities are expected to remain tepid due to festivities Demands are expected to be tempered as non-banking bank uh, liquidity will be geared towards relatively higher non-sovereign instruments. That's for the Treasury bills and the bonds market. And also for the central bank's special bills, not much of activity there. Only the 30th of May 2022 paper had two deals and then, of course, value at more than 204 billion. Let's flip over to the very, very popular market. I call it the very, very popular market uh, all across the world. It was up by 1.07%. And of course, it came on the back of the likes of Nestle, uh, MTN Nigeria, Access Bank, so which made the market um, year-to-day performance to come at 6.07%. Month-to-date, we're, uh, we're, we're up by just slightly below 2%. And then, of course, the sectoral performance a mixed picture there, the likes, the banking sector, the consumer goods, the insurance sector were in the green, while the industrial goods as well as the oil and gas were down. But at the end of it, we came out in the positive uh, territory for the equities market. Total volume, volume of transactions in the green, value in the green, but the deals were in the red. So we're starting the new year, and of course, we will be expecting, uh, of course, we just keep our, our fingers crossed for how the market will pan out in the first trading session. Yeah, uh, trading yeah day. Uh, fingers crossed, Anita, but I need you to look into your crystal ball now. Uh, are we going to have a bullish or bearish week, the first week? Well, of course, you know, the markets, all the markets in Nigeria are closed today, so, and of course, nobody can have a, a very, you know, accurate crystal ball, but... I, but um, I, I trust your crystal ball. And no, Nathan, I, but think, I think optimism is always my watchword. Optimism. And it's, yeah. So All right. Yeah. All right, Nita, thank you so much. Okay, so after the break, uh, we'll look at uh, other markets. That's uh, the crypto markets. That's in a moment. Just stay with us. Welcome back. You're still watching Business Morning live on channels, television. Now let's uh, look at the crypto market. We see Bitcoin struggling to recover above the 48,000 resistance against the U.S. dollar. You see, BTC could actually decline heavily if there's a clear break below 46,000. You see the market cap there, $2.24 trillion is up about 0.38%. 24-hour uh, volume traded uh, in a total crypto market, $75.32 billion. And we see Bitcoin dominance there falling below the 40% uh, range. Where price of Bitcoin, 47,000. It's down 0.42%. Uh, we see Ethereum there also, uh, but Ethereum actually uh, looking up, up 1.62%, but with uh, little volume compared to what we normally have. It's just $10.21 billion trading Ethereum. Top of the market cap there, we see it's uh, mostly red, just uh, Binance coin there uh, up 0.48%. Anyway, let's uh, bring in Olumide Additional now, uh, financial market uh, analyst. Hello, Olumide. Hello, Laji. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning and happy new year. Same to you, yeah. Well, we see it's a new year in the crypto market. Uh, Lumide, what are you expecting? Yeah, um, right now we're seeing trading uh, volumes quite low. You need to understand that um, key markets around the world still remain closed, particularly in Asia, that contribute to a large volume in the crypto market. So I think um, volume is picking up. And... Um, we need to know that, uh, understand the narrative that um, investors are starting to be a bit conservative. You know, Omicron is disrupting the world's uh, second biggest economy. I'm talking of China. And the fact that we're seeing case loads rising in Europe also is creating some form of fears. And that's why we're seeing the dollar going up. So across um, risky assets, that include crypto assets, we're seeing um, down, draw, drawdowns, uh, sorry, uh, across board. But I think... Um, we need to understand that the background coming from the crypto market in 2021 has been fairly exciting. Bitcoin has recorded uh, major gains, um, more than more uh, mainstream assets. According to Goodman Sachs, Bitcoin was ranked number one behind crude oil, behind S&P and other stock indexes. That just gives you the credence that the crypto market is getting more exciting. But you see, uh, the coming um, the coming months seems to be facing. Um, strong headwinds in the crypto market. We're looking at the fact that regulations are coming in strong forces. Um, I'm waiting to see what the stable coin framework will look like. I'm also looking at how NFT will be regulated. So, yes, despite the fact the market has grown so fast, I think the year 2022 
will be a year of consolidation and where regulatory uh, framework could take place. All right. Uh, talking about NFTs, we see uh, Eminem, the Grammy Award-winning rappers, joined the Board Ape Yacht Club, uh, purchasing one of the uh, non-fungible token uh, apes for about 123.45 ether. That's $462,000. Why is he buying yeah. this? For and it's, why is this so expensive? Uh, um, uh, Ladi, to be fair with you, you need to understand that uh, uh, the NFT space has caught a lot of investors unaware. And you look at uh, assets you just mentioned, uh, the bot apes, for example. They are kind of the demand for it is so high, and because of their unique fundamentals among celebra uh, celebrities like Snoop Dogg and just recently Eminem, reports that Britney Spears also. Uh, uh, had some hold on that really triggered uh, the price uh, the price appreciation of that asset. Also, we've seen that uh, similar NFTs like CryptoPunks uh, with the likes of um, Visa buying um, into that has also given uh, uh, price appreciation. So I think in peculiar reasons, why we are seeing so much price appreciation is the brands coming to it, the personality, and the fact that it has uh, some form of... Um, investment um, uh, perspective among a lot of young people. The, the, the cheapest board apes you can get in the market right now is about $150,000. And this was something that was given uh, free to many users in 2017. So that just tells you how the market has changed over, over the year. 2021 was the year that we saw trading volumes of NFTs hitting more than $10 billion. That is more than, that is far more than uh, the revenues of Nigeria's top tier one uh, bank. So that just gives you the credence that um, NFTs are gaining um, uh, momentum. But I, I feel users need to be very careful that you, you, they need to understand the risk behind it. NFTs are not so liquid. Uh, so you need to be very choosy about what you buy into. And also, uh, you need to um, transact with people that have verified identity. That's one but, of the but keys they, of enjoying the uh, NFT four, market. Four, 462 thousand dollars for a jpeg yeah. <laughs> does it expect yeah, exactly. to make a profit on this uh, I, I, of course i'm I, i'm expecting price appreciation across that because uh, um one, 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 one nft was sold for more than five million dollars and you, you know eminem being having such a cultic personality this is someone that has won more than 50 grammys you, you know number of users he, he has you know so i think uh, that would definitely push uh, price uh, appreciation of that. He has already changed his um, Twitter handle to the uh, to the JPEG picture already. And okay. you see, the, the thing we need to understand about uh, uh, price appreciation in assets is that the personality and the demand is really what pushed this price up. So I won't be surprised if the price triple in a couple of uh, months, you know. I won't be okay. surprised at all. That, that all right. So uh, another issue is the uh, central bank you know, digital currencies, uh, looking at the e-Naira, what's your outlook, you know, for the e-Naira for 2022? The outlook for the e naira for 2022, in simple terms, is um, I'm very bullish about it. You, you need to understand that, um, you know, when uh, three months ago, when the CBN um, uh, started this, this uh, pilot program, a lot of people, a lot of critics uh, saw this as a... Uh, a mirage, and you see, look at if you look at transaction volumes and the number of up um, downloads, we already see close to one million uh, uh, downloads already, and we've already seen high participation from foreign online merchants building on the CBN and, and network. So I, I'm bullish about it, and already look at Nigerian banks, the likes of GT, Stambik, have already gotten um, high demand from the e wallets. Uh, uh, Uploads. Also, uh, I think one of the major objectives of the CBN is coming to play. You need to understand that uh, financial inclusion remains the key parameter across the uh, spectrum. And uh, recent statistics shows that uh, the INA is getting very strong in the northern part of Nigeria, where we have um, a relatively weak uh, financial infrastructure compared to Lagos. So the likes of Boronu, Sukutu, Zamfara, Kasuna, Kanu are leading. Uh, the Bitcoin uh, in our interest. Uh, there. That's quite so interesting. I think it's the positivity around it is uh, it is very. But you know, uh, the banks need, still need to educate people. The apps still show some buggy uh, fundamental uh, fundamental characteristics. So I feel that uh, work is still going to be done. But I think I'm bullish on it, and I think banks that are exposed to it start to gain a lot. Well, work still needs to be done. You know, it's uh, it's actually new tech. All right, uh, Illuminate. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, for coming, as always. Yeah, thank you.
All right, and uh, that's a wrap on the program. Don't forget to join us by 1.30 on Business Incorporated for more updates on developments in the world of business. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Ladi Williams. Bye for now.